Institute. And it's for outstanding faculty members or other officials at the university. Uh, come up and see us in Park City during the summer and talk about their work and what they're doing. Um, and so we've had folks from the medical program, uh, I'm a director over at the Museum of Fine Arts, uh, the director Gretchen came up and told us what was going on uh, over at the Fine Arts Museum. Um, this summer I was on the road a bit and only got to go to uh, the best of those programs. Uh, and that was a few weeks ago. Um, and a professor from the computing department came up and talked about her work with visualization of large data. Um, and seeing the opportunity this morning to invite Mariah over uh, to share with us some of her work, uh, I think over the next decade, two decades, uh, this is going to be one of the most important and exciting fields uh, that businesses are going to encounter. It's how to make use of that huge and oftentimes new resource we have uh, in the field of information. Uh, so Dr. Mariah Meyer uh, is um, our guest this morning. She comes to us from the computing faculty. Um, she is, by education, interested in astronomy and science, and has kind of migrated through a uh, Penn State graduate, uh, so from Nittany Valley, a uh, great part of the country, a uh, great school. Uh, that's, I don't know if you ever, uh, I'm a director of the Smithsonian in Washington, and our chief science officer came from Penn State. Uh, and Dr. Pell has um, uh, reminded me on numerous occasions uh, what a great institution Penn State is, uh, in spite of the uh, unfortunate publicity its athletic program is uh, uh, But great, great school. Um, her um, fields of interest, astronomy, astrophysics, um, then migrated to computer science, postdoctoral research, at Harvard. Uh, she uh, has been a visiting scientist at the Broad Institute at MIT in Harvard. She is a TED Fellow for 2013. She's got a Microsoft Faculty Research Grant. Um, she is um, in Fast Company's list of 100 most creative people in the country. Uh, and has a number of other accolades, including a stint as a science writer for the Chicago Tribune. Mariah, welcome to class. Please come and uh, speak. <laughs> Going to take a second to set up your computer and mic you up if you don't mind. <laughs> nerving at the start of class when your students are staring at you and you're trying to set up and you're like, man, I hope I don't mess up. I hope no embarrassing email notifications come up. Yeah, I'll give you some cover. <laughs> Anything I missed in the introduction? <laughs> Anything I shorted? Um, well, I, I do at the end. So when, when Al invited me here and he, he asked that I you know, talk a little bit about my background. I said, oh, well, it's all on my bio. And he was sort of like, well, it's a bit dry and uninspiring. So at the end. Uh, I said that? Well, I, I'm perhaps paraphrasing here. Um, but at the end, I do have a little bit more of a um, visualization of my life. So if everyone makes it to the end of the talk, we'll go over that. about me in the beginning because I don't think that's nearly as exciting as uh, the kinds of um, work that I am very fortunate to get uh, to be involved in. That's where we're going to start today. So about 10 years ago, we hit a bit of a data milestone where for the first time ever, we, we had generated uh, five exabytes of data. 
Anyone have a sense of what five exabytes of data is? Five exabytes? It's a lot. So it's about five billion billion bits of information. And it's also roughly equivalent to all the words ever spoken on this planet by humans. Now since then, the rate that we've been generating data has been growing exponentially. And experts now agree that this year, we're going to be generating roughly on the order of 7.3 exabytes of data a day. And that means that by, oh, 4.30 this afternoon, we will have created the same amount of information that took all of mankind roughly 14,000 years to produce. Right? So, so that's a lot of data. Now, luckily for us, though, that 7.3 exabytes of data we're generating today is not just internet cat videos. But <laughs> a lot of this data is coming from fields like the sciences, uh, engineering, medicine, and humanities, and also in economics and, uh, and business. And these scientists and researchers and scholars are really looking to this data to be able to answer some of our most pressing questions, to unveil the mysteries of the universe, to cure human disease, and to just even help us live healthier, happier, and more productive lives. But in order to actually do to actually answer these sorts of questions, the first really big thing that we're starting to tackle now is how do we make sense of this wealth of information that now surrounds us? Now, today I'm going to tell you about one of my passions, which is actually making sense of this data, or why interactive visualization is worth a thousand numbers. Now, my passion really lives at the intersection of computer science, of design, and of science where I develop interactive visualization tools that help scientists to make sense of complex data. Now, I spend a lot of time working very closely with my collaborators in order to deeply understand how they think about their data and about their science. And then I use that understanding to feed back into my own design process to try to create tools that are both intuitive and revealing. Now, the fundamental reason we even care about visualization boils down to data, lots and lots of data. And data has really become one of the defining characteristics about this moment in our history. A professor at UC Berkeley named Joe Hellerstein a couple years ago, a few years ago coined this the industrial revolution of data. And what this means for you is that data has fundamentally changed how you work, how you play, and how you make really important decisions. And it has impacted every aspect of your lives. Uh, now, uh, a couple of years, uh, just last summer, the Pew Research Center uh, released their report into quote unquote big data. And the really interesting findings were right here on the front page where they say, experts say new forms of information analysis will help us to be more nimble and adaptive. But they worry over our capacity to understand and use these new tools well. And this was echoed by a statement by uh, Google's chief economist, Hal Varian, where he says, the ability to take data, to be able to understand it, to process it, to extract value from it, to visualize and communicate it, that's going to be a hugely important skill in the next decade. Now, visualization has really emerged as one of those, as one of the, the, the sort of pillars behind doing this thing, which is making sense of data. And it really uh, involves, uh, it's, it's really a very multidisciplinary kind of field. It's not just about creating pretty pictures, but it's about uh, collaboration and understanding of uh, the world around you and how people see things. Um, and, and what may surprise you is even though we largely teach visualization as an engineering domain, it requires a lot of skills that aren't typically taught in, scientists, uh, in scientific or engineering fields. Things like trustworthiness and empathy and a curiosity to learn about a new field. And it's also really important that we, um, that we have a diverse set of people and thoughts and perspectives going into the field in order to grapple with this huge challenge of making sense of data. Um, right, okay, so next what I want to do is I'm just going to motivate a little bit um, since the, you know we're here, we're, we're sort of talking about data. I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the places, at least in science, which is really where my passion lies, um, of, of what I mean by really big, complex data. In biology, uh, scientists are now um, looking at, the, we're with the advent of really amazing techno technological advances in sequencing. Scientists really now want to combine huge genomics databases with information about long-term clinical outcomes. And then they want to be able to compare all this data across large populations of people. And the challenge here is that even though they think embedded somewhere in all this data are things like a cure for cancer, 
how do we actually go about comparing data that's, that ranges all the way down from the molecular level up to large groups of people? In astronomy, there's a new optical telescope that's going to be coming online pretty soon called the Large Synaptic Survey Telescope that, that when it is uh, running, is going to be producing the world's largest ever optical survey of the night sky. And it's going to be generating data roughly at the order of 40 C CDs worth of information every single minute. And one of the things that's super cool about this project is that they're going to be releasing all of this information out to the public so that we can engage in citizen science which is awesome, but given that amount of data, how are we even gonna to begin to know where to look for something new and interesting? How are we gonna go about helping these scientists to make new discoveries? And in physics, uh, probably many of you heard a lot about the, the LHC over in Switzerland last, or over in Switzerland and France last summer um, because it's, a large, it's the world's largest particle accelerator and it was in the news a lot because of the discovery of the Higgs boson AKA the God particle. Well, it turns out that discovering anything at all in this particle accelerator is pretty amazing. Um, when it's up and running, the accelerator is producing upwards of 600 million particle collisions every single second. Uh, it turns out that's way too many for the engineers to be able to stream off of the detectors. So they had, they, ha they had to install a series of what they call triggers, which are essentially a bunch of filters to filter out those particle collisions and just to keep the most important. So from that original 600 million, they're only keeping 200. But are those the best 200 to keep? How do we know what to keep and what to throw away when it's not even clear what we're looking for anymore? So these are just some of the really big challenges that scientists are dealing with today. Um, but these challenges aren't just limited to science. We see this um, all over the place in health. We see this um, in the humanities. And I'm sure many of you um, are probably grappling with this in uh, business and finance and economic sorts of domains. Um, but how, so, so what, are, what are our strategies right now? Like how do we go about doing something with these huge data sets? Well, fundamentally, we have two, um, two different kinds of approaches. And the first approach is to take these huge data sets and to try to reduce them down to smaller things that we can actually wrap our head around and make sense out of. Let me give you an example of this. I'm going to tell you about a really big data set, a really big and diverse data set, um, one that high school students all across the country use every single year to make an important decision, and that decision is where to go to college. So the U.S. News and World Report every year puts out a ranking of, 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 of the U.S. colleges across the country. Has anyone in here not ever looked up their school in this? <laughs> right. It's something we all do. Um, so the way that this ranking system works is that the U.S. News and World Report goes around to all the colleges and universities in this country and collects tons and tons of information. Things like test scores of incoming freshmen, student to teacher ratios, and even the salary of professors. Well, I suspect the salary of professors in the business school might be a little higher. But we'll, we'll get on that for now. Um, and so they collect tons of this information and then what they do is they push it through a numerical model that spits out a rank ordered list of schools. I was looking at the ranking for this year, and I noticed two schools that were given the same ranking. One of those schools happens to be one of my alma maters, and it is a large public state-funded institution in the middle of rural Pennsylvania with a nationally <laughs> ranked athletic program. Um, and the other school is a small, private, religious college in the heart of Manhattan with separate campuses for men and women. Uh, most of us would probably agree that the educational experience that we would get at one of those schools is likely to be hugely different than we would get at the other. And yet, according to this ranking, those experiences were rated equivalently. What's the problem here? The problem is that by taking this massive, diverse, complex data set and reducing it down to something that we can <coughs> make decisions about and make sense of, we stripped away much of the richness of that original data. And this is a real problem. But there is another way, and that's where visualization comes in. Visualization gives us the ability to go in and look at and explore complex data. It lets us um, uh, validate numerical models in our data, such as this image over on the left, which is showing you the output of a complex um, gene genomic sequence assembly algorithm. 
it reveals patterns and trends that might otherwise have been obscured, such as the wind map that I'm showing you, that's looking at wind currents across the country from a day earlier this summer. It also gives us the ability to just take data and sort of turn it on its head and give us a fresh perspective about what might be contained therein, such as the Wordle that I created from um, a summary of the talk that I'm giving you right now. Um, but visualization also has increasingly become incredibly important for allowing us to make really difficult, important decisions. And that gets us to the Challenger disaster. How many people in here remember this day back in 1986? How many people were alive on this day? <laughs> <laughs> um, so for me, I, I distinctly remember sitting in my elementary school classroom, because this was back when we used to watch every uh, space shuttle launch. It was always a very exciting event. Um, and what happened was 73 seconds after liftoff, the space shuttle Challenger exploded. Um, now, uh, what's interesting about this story is that what happened the day before the launch was that the temperatures at the launch site were predicted to be very low. They were going to be in the 20s. And the engineers that designed the rockets that were going to take the Space Shuttle Challenger into orbit were really concerned about this. And in particular, they were concerned about the potential failure of these rubber O-rings. So they were, they, what they wanted to do was to try to persuade <coughs> the NASA officials to delay the launch. So they spent hours pulling together lots of data about what they knew about the resiliency of rubber, um, about O-ring damage, and they created a series of 13 charts. And here, I'm, I'm just showing you four of those charts. Now, these charts um, presented all different kinds of information that they had gathered. And in particular, there's one chart, the one in the upper right-hand corner, that's showing you the names of rockets that had been launched that had O-ring damage. And that temp the temperature that the launch was shown over on the right. And that bottom one, SRM-25, that was the name of the rocket on the Space Shuttle Challenger. So they took all this data, they sent it to NASA officials. NASA officials looked at it and they thought it was inconclusive. And they were actually rather appalled that these engineers had suggested that they delay the launch. So they overrode those concerns and decided to launch. And the next day, 73 seconds after the liftoff, it exploded. It turned out the cause of the explosion was actually known pretty soon. It was, in fact, O-ring failure. But what took everyone a lot longer to try to untangle was what broke down in that chain of communication that led to this disaster. Um, how many of you have heard of Edward Tufte before? Anyone? Um, so Edward Tufte is a relatively well-known visualization historian. And he, he used this disaster as a case study for the importance of clear, articulate visualization. So he actually took that data that we saw on that, in that upper right hand of the temperatures, and he plotted it in this chart. So on the horizontal axis, we're looking at temperature from 85 degrees down. And on the vertical axis, we're looking at the amount of O-ring damage. And what he did is he took information about rockets that had been launched with damage, and he plotted it along with contextual information about a bunch of other rocket launches that had no damage. And what you see is that about below 65 degrees, there wasn't a single launch that happened without some amount of damage, and that in fact, that damage seemed to increase quite a bit. That little gray bar over there on the left those were the temperatures on the morning of the Space Shuttle Challenger launch. Of course, hindsight's always 20-20, right? But here the point is really, really that if we present data in context and in a very clear and accurate way, the answers oftentimes just seem to pop out at us. Um, in the 25 years since this disaster, we've come a long way, and I'm sure that everyone in this room has software on their home computer that can generate a plot like this in a matter of minutes. But we've also um, come a long way in learning about visualization principles, how it works and why it works. And fundamentally, visualization works off of two core ideas. And the first one is that visualization uses perception to point out interesting things. So for example, say I give you this string of letters, and I ask you to count the number of times you see the letter V, as in Victor. Read through the string of letters, what if I show it to you like this, right? The answer is immediately obvious when I encode those Vs with color red. And this is because we're, we're, we're relying on our powerful perceptual system to help us point us um, towards the things that are most interesting to see. 
Now the second principle that visualization works off of is that it uses pictures to enhance working memory. So another little task. Say I give you these 50 numbers, which number appears most often? 26. Oh. Yeah. So I like this, right? And everyone knows that answer pretty quickly. And what's happening is that task is actually cognitively pretty hard because it re requires you to not only do a search task, but to also keep multiple relationships in your mind while you're doing that. And it turns out that our short-term working memory is really not very good. So visualization lets us offload a lot of that cognitive burden by creating physical, well, okay, I shouldn't say physical, but creating artifacts out in the world that we can then use to free up cognition for higher level tasks. Visualization isn't, though, just a collection of techniques and, and, and visual representations. Um, um, we actually know a lot about, uh, about really basic underlying principles like these and how we can, and that we can apply to create effective encodings. And now, I, I'm an engineer, and as an engineer, I rely on rules and principles to build things. And so in this way, um, I'll tell you a little bit about what we know about visualization from that perspective. A lot of the early research that was done in the visualization community looked at the fundamental visual encoding channels that we have for encoding values. So here I'm showing you all the different encoding channels we have for looking at numbers. Um, these early researchers also conducted a lot of controlled laboratory experiments in order to understand which kinds of encoding channels are easiest for us to interpret. It turns out color, which you see used all the time for numbers, is one of the hardest things that, that you could present information to somebody to, um, to make sense of. Whereas spatial encoding, such as position along a common axis or length, are much, much more accurate for us. I have an example of this. Um, here what you're looking at is a visualization called a heat map. And it is probably one of the most widely used representations in biology today. And the way that this works is that we're encoding values with color. So low values are encoded with green, high values with red. And each one of those strips is a value that's changing over time. Looking at this, can you tell which of these uh, strips is changing over time in a similar way? Or which ones contain peaks and valleys? But let me encode it for you this way, where we're using a spatial encoding, where now position along the vertical axis shows that value. And in this kind of encoding, the nuanced characteristics of the data is much, much clearer. It's very easy to see who's similar and who's different. <coughs> and this is because it's much more natural for us to translate changes in position than it is to translate changes in color. OK, as a brief little interlude, um, how many people in here play video games? And hands up, I want to see. And by this, I, I don't just mean first-person shooter. I mean if you play you know, uh, Words with Friends, or if you play Spider, or any of those things. You, you play video games, right? So it's probably most people in this room. And so I'm sort of curious, like, what do you think has allowed this sort of explosion of video games and the popularity of them to really come into to play like it is today? Like, technologically, what is it that, that really enabled that? Any thoughts? <coughs> Well, we've seen expansion on a variety of platforms that you have to have video games on the past. Typically, in the past, you had them on PCs or on consoles that cater to a rather specific market, and, and now you can have them on pretty much anything that has a battery. Mm -hmm. You can play games on a Kindle, mm -hmm. not, not a Kindle Fire, like a, like a book or a Kindle. Right? <laughs> um, I mean, you can get to them anywhere. Right, so so variety of platforms. Other ideas? <clears throat> Sorry, what was that? Reduction in price? Yep. <clears throat> These are more readily available in the market overall. Yep. Um, I actually think also visually it takes a lot. It's a lot of money. It's not really well, but a lot of folks are out of it. Right, so we can get a lot more complexity than we see. Yep. Any other? There's a social aspect to games a lot nowadays. Yep. Yeah, so 
clearly all, the, all of these thoughts are, are certainly things that have contributed. Um, somewhat related to what you were thinking um, is the, the increase in, in just computational power that's happened over the last 10 years that's led to increased levels of interactivity with higher frame weight, rates. We can get a lot more um, interesting things going on, whether you're on your you know, game-specific desktop machine or even on your smartphone. So the, this role of computational power and the increased ability to interact with things has also fundamentally changed the field of visualization over the last 10 years. And now we're no longer just limited to static visualization. Um, interactivity lends for an enormous amount of sense making, particularly when we start talking about really big complex data sets. And what I found in my own research is that sometimes by simply adding interactivity, I can increase my collaborator's order of under, or, uh, understanding by orders of magnitude. And so um, I'm going to give you now a couple of examples from um, projects that I've worked on um, in the field of biology, um, specifically using interactive visualization tools that I designed with them. And the first one um, was a collaboration with a group at the Harvard Medical School who study fruit flies. And it's headed up by a biologist named Angela DePace. And just to clear up any confusion, um, that's Angela on the upper right, and those are the flies on the lower right. <laughs> so Angela and her lab um, are really interested in understanding the genomic origins of, of um, which genes are turned on and off in development, and how do we become different people from basically the core same set of genes. Um, and they do this by studying fruit fly embryos. When I started working with them, um, sorry, it's a little bit hard to see that black background, when I first started working with them, they were creating lots and lots and lots of static plots that looked just like this. So what you're looking at on the left-hand side of that black square are the location of cells in a fruit fly embryo. Each one of those symbols represents a cell. And then on the right, what you see is information about each one of those cells, specifically which genes are turned on and off over time. Now these two views were linked together with shape and color meaning that strip of cells that, were, that have the blue circle are linked to the column of data with the label B circle. But what, what these scientists couldn't actually do from these static plots, though, is know for an individual cell on the left, <coughs> which little strip of data on the right corresponds to that cell. So when I first started working with them, um, I just basically took the visual representations that they were using and simply added interactivity. So this is just a, a screen capture from the very first prototype that I developed um, for this group. Um, and what it allowed for was for them to, um, for the first time ever, to actually select an individual cell and see that cell's gene information over on the right. And this allowed this group, for the first time ever, to explore their data on a cell-by-cell -cell basis. And it was amazing what they discovered just by being able to do this. They discovered problems in their data collection method, as well as some shortcomings of the computational models that they had been using. I, I worked with this group for about two years, and we went through a couple of prototypes since this one. And basically, um, I ended up applying a lot of, of these known visualization principles to the visual encodings, but also worked a lot with the group to integrate this visualization into their computational workflow in order to combine both computational results with the underlying raw data. And this um, is the final tool that we developed. It's uh, called Multisum. Multisum is now one of the primary analysis tools that's used by this lab as they try to untangle the mysteries behind fruit flies, mysteries that actually have um, implications for our own understanding of human disease. Here we're looking at a very, very, very different kind of data, still biological data, but this is actually genetic information. Um, and what you have in the circle plot is you have, um, you have a chromosome from, from a genome or around the circle. And on the inside, each of those red lines is linking two parts of that chromosome that share similar genetic information, meaning that A, T, Cs, and Gs look roughly the same. Then in all those concentric colorful rings, there's all kinds of additional information about, uh, known information about those regions in the chromosome. So looking at this, can anyone see the, the interesting thing in here? Or an interesting thing in here? Large space on the left side. Pardon? Large space on the left side. Yep, there, there, there's a large space. 
maybe that's important. I, I'm not sure. Um, I like personally, I don't know where to look in this because there's so so much going on. We would actually call this visualization a very data dense uh, visualization because it crams lots and lots and lots of information into a small space. Um, this actually does very little, though, for helping us be able to make sense and wrap our heads around a complex data set. And this is a, this is a, a place where interactivity plays another really <coughs> important role in visualization. So here we're looking at um, a tool, another tool that I created called NIMBY, and it's looking at very similar sorts of data. But instead of cramming everything into just a single view, it splits it up across three different views um, in a pattern called multiple linked views. So the user can interactively um, select different kinds of views over on this right circle view. I can select a different chromosome. Um, and then that middle view gets up updated with information about that selection. I can then go into that middle view and also select the more data. And that data is then reflected all the way on the right. Now this design pattern is called overview plus detail on demand. And it is probably one of the most powerful widely used design patterns that you see in visualization tools today. Sure. Yeah. Just got a quick question. How long does it take you to come up with these prototypes? Um, it varies. Uh, this one was probably about an eight-month project. The one I just showed you was two years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd be happy to talk more, um, especially in, in the Q and A about that collaboration process. It, it varies a lot. Um, yeah. So, uh, so this sort of design pattern is super important for keeping someone from being overwhelmed and help them explore and navigate into a large data set. MISB was actually designed to support scientists um, who work in a field called comparative genomics. And in this field, scientists are asking questions like, how do you compare a human and a lizard? My collaborator, uh, Manfred Grebher, was tackling this question by comparing the human genome with that of the lizard and looking for regions of similarity between the two. Uh, when Manfred and I started working together, um, he was really relying on static plots that looked something like this. So what we're looking at here is we're looking at one human, human chromosome compared to one chromosome from the lizard. And each one of the dots inside indicates, again, a region of sequence similarity between those two chromosomes. But what Manfred, um, uh, but, uh, sorry, what am I saying? In order for Manfred to actually look across his full data set, he had to look at many of these plots. In fact, his full data set was producing over 300 of them. Not only were these static plots unintuitive and overwhelming, but it turned out they were actually uh, hiding some really critical subtleties in his computational model. So he and I worked together for a couple of months and designed this tool called NISB. And again, here I'm just showing you a screenshot from one part of that. Um, and the way that NISB works is um, in the outer ring, we're looking at the human genome. And on the inner ring, we're looking at the genome from that of the lizard. And the inner ring then also contains one user-selected chromosome from that outer ring that is then emanating a set of colored lines. And each one of those lines represents a region of similarity between those two genomes. Now, using this B, scientists can very quickly go through and explore their full data sets and to really try to build up a mental model of interesting patterns and trends that may be contained therein. This is actually a screenshot from the very, very, very first data set that Manfred loaded into MISB. By, by some measures, this is a rather aesthetic image. There's lots of colors and circles, and everyone seems to love circles. But for Manfred, when he saw this, he was really disappointed, um, because what he saw was really ugly, messy data. And in fact, he had no idea that his algorithms were producing so much noise, that there were so many lines going to different places. He had never noticed this in those dot plots he'd been looking at before. So after he saw this, he went back to his algorithm and he started tweaking a lot of parameters and he was able to get with this far. What was really disconcerting to him was that he knew what he was seeing here went against what he knew to be bi biologically true. So he went back to the drawing board and he developed a brand new model and that model gave him this data set. Now he's since gone on to publish his results in the scientific community and also release his software open source. And I asked him later um, how long it would have taken him to make this breakthrough using the visualization methods he had available to him prior to MISB. What he told me was, honestly, I don't think I would ever have gotten here. 
Well, today, most biologists are just like Manfred, um, and they're using both computational and visualization tools to make sense of their complex data. But when I go and talk to these biologists, what I hear over and over and over again is that even though they have these very general purpose tools um, that are widely available, and they can load their data into these tools, they're rarely giving them answers to their very specific questions. So in contrast, the tools that we design in my research lab um, are both uh, very nimble and specific. And we focus on being able to capture the mental models of the, of the scientists that we work with. And we have this philosophy that uh, we should create really, really simple user interfaces because we think that our collaborators should spend less time thinking about the tool and more time thinking about their science. So I'm just going to tell you briefly about one other um, uh, project um, that I worked on, and this was with a group at the Broad Institute that's headed up by a biologist named Abid Regev. And they're studying, um, their, their model organism of choice is yeast, which sounds fascinating, I know, but it's really amazing what you can learn from yeast, and their, their work ultimately is looking for more effective drug therapies. So when we started working with them, one of several different kinds of data that they were looking at um, was, again, this gene expression information, so how much genes are turned on and off. And they were using these, these awesome, awesome color heat maps. Um, and this is just a sample for some of their data. In particular, they knew a lot about the three genes that I'm showing you here. Each column represents a gene, and the rows represent different species. So they knew a lot about these three genes. They knew which of the genes should look roughly the same across the species and which ones should look different. But they lamented that these patterns were very difficult to see in this heat map. So we worked with them and we developed a new visual representation called a curve map um, that I'm showing you here. Um, and the curve map is each one of those little squares, again, is showing you gene expression over time for user-selected genes along the columns um, and a bunch of different, uh, 14 different species of yeast down in rows. Um, and so they had been looking at this data for several years using like heat map types of tools. And so what they knew about these three genes was they knew, for example, that gene five should look quite different down the species, which you look down and you see the curves are different, which is in contrast to gene seven, where the curves look much more similar. Now, when we showed them an early prototype of this tool, these were some of the first things that they, they clicked on and loaded because they wanted to be able to verify that they could see known trends in this new representation. And what they said is that this would have taken them on the order of 30 minutes to see in a heat map, but was instantaneously <coughs> available to them in this new representation. Another thing that they knew about was the pairwise relationship of gene five and gene six. So if you look at these two genes down on the species, you notice that the curves look remarkably the same, or remarkably similar. Again, something they knew, something they, ver they used to verify this visualization. And then they actually saw something they had never ever seen before and that was the relationship for species seven. And you'll notice here, the curves don't actually, they look like mirror images. This group saw this and they had no idea what was going on. They had never noticed this before. So this caused them to go back to the lab and do some follow-up experiments. And they actually found out that this difference was related to a previously unknown gene duplication event in the ancient history of this species of yeast. So not only with this new representation could we increase the efficiency at which they could do known things, um, but we were also able to show them something that led to new hypotheses and ultimately a new scientific discovery. Um, so I want to stress that the visualization isn't just this collection of techniques and ideas, but that it's also a process. And the process that I use um, very much relies on working closely with collaborators in order to make sure that our designs and our ideas are reflective of the needs that they have. And this process that I'm showing you here is really used to help us help guide our design process toward developing effective tools. So, you know, real world's always messier than in theory, and this is a little bit more accurate about what it looks like to work on one of these projects. But in all of this, there's one particularly critical step, and that's translate. And translate is about translating from the language of biology or whatever domain you're working in into the language of visualization. Um, and it's absolutely essential to get these translations correct because no amount of brilliant design can overcome designing for the wrong thing. So to get my translations correct, I spend a lot of time um, sitting and, and working and observing and inter interviewing my collaborators. 
Um, while I was um, doing a postdoc back at Harvard, I got the opportunity to spend many, many days just hanging out in biology labs. And I even got to learn a few experimental techniques along the way. Um, I wouldn't trust myself to pipe at anything of importance and I'm terrible at anything that requires accuracy. But these experiences really helped me to better understand the intuitions of the people that I work with, intuitions that I can then feed back into my designs. Um, so just to sort of wrap this up, I just wanted to, to close by saying um, I absolutely love what I do because I get to do a little bit of a lot of different things. And visualization is a really young, multifaceted, growing field that relies on uh, skills not normally taught, well, some skills, but not all the things you need to be a great visualization designer we learn in our traditional engineering and scientific disciplines. Um, it requ requires things like empathy and trustworthiness um, and curiosity. And visualization really allows us to simplify complex data, to reveal meaningful patterns, and ultimately to provide insight into data. And scientists today are using visualization to confirm both their data as well as their hypotheses and models, to generate new hypotheses that ultimately can lead to new discoveries. Um, visualization has really um, emerged, I think, at, at, as the, one of the forefront, at the forefront of uh, important things for being able to deal with data around us. Um, and uh, it's, even though I think I talk a lot about science in here, I hope that there's some obvious bridges to perhaps some of the data and challenges that you guys will all be dealing with as you go forward in your careers. So um, before I put up my thank you, have any questions slide, here's my really quick rundown of where I came from. Um, so it starts back in the year zero. Um, as a computer scientist, we like to start at zero. Um, I was born in Martinsville, Virginia, which does any, anyone know where that is? There's no, there's no reason to know where that is. <laughs> The, the, little, the little corner of Virginia up in the mountains, that's where I was born. Um, when I was a kid, at some point, my dad bought a Commodore 64. He was enamored with this Commodore 64 because he would create all these little <coughs> spelling tests for me on it. And he was so excited when he got this voice um, translator, so it would talk to me in this horrible computerized voice, and it would say, the sky is blue, and I'd have to type in the word blue. Anyway, so I spent many days like working through these like spelling tests. Um, um, so at some point, I decided that space was super cool, and I wanted to become an astronaut. Then I thought maybe being a surgeon would be better. Then I settled on being a surgeon in a space station. Then reality hit. Turns out I get really motion sick, so I decided just to go to college, um, where I studied astronomy and astrophysics, but largely because it was a really, to me, it was a really interesting way to study math and physics, which is where, where my sort of intellectual passion seemed to take me. At some point, I actually graduated. Um, didn't know what to do for a while, so I traveled and then ran out of money and ended up as a software engineer at Raytheon. Turned out this was the year 1999, so if you had the word computer on your resume, you got a job, but I didn't know anything about being a software engineer. So I started taking classes at night in computer science and discovered that I actually really, really loved it. Um, and in fact, that I think at heart, I'm an engineer and I like to make things, I'm a maker. Um, and that fits better with my personality than studying one wavelength of light for the rest of your life. Um, so this led me eventually to a computer graphics class um, that uh, sort of changed the way that I thought about computer science and what I might be able to do as a computer scientist. And I was really like, wow, you know, through graphics and visualization, here's a way to be involved um, and make an impact in science, but doing the making part that I really enjoy. So I went to grad school actually here at DU and also eventually successfully finished. Um, and then went off to, and spent a couple of years doing a postdoc at Harvard. Um, and I really used that opportunity um, to, uh, you know, after you finish your PhD, you go off, you finally have the skills to do something useful with yourself. Um, so I decided to use it to explore, like, what is it that I'm really passionate about? What is it in research that, that can really make me motivated to do this for the rest of my life? Um, and I started meeting biologists and other scientists and it was really this idea of being able to enable them in answering complex questions um, that motivated me. And that's where I started doing the work that I was showing you today. Postdocs end, unfortunately, because they're the best jobs ever. Um, went on the job market and ended up accepting um, a position back here at the U in the School of Computing um, and also in the Scientific Computing and Imaging Institute. And we're roughly here. I won't put an exact date to it. <laughs> so that's my story. 
Um, I hope that's a little more interesting than what's on my bio page. Um, but with that, I uh, just want to say thank you so much for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, other than working with some, um, I have a project that's working with some psychologists and cognitive psychologists to think about how people really, um, what their mental models are and how they perceive <coughs> things. I haven't looked at behavioral science data. Um, I do, since, since coming here, I have though started working with a bunch of other kinds of groups. So probably the, the, the farthest extreme end right now is I have a, a project with some poets on campus. So we're talking about how to visualize poetry. <coughs> don't ask me how to do it, because I don't know yet. We're still, we're still working on that important bit. Um, but that's, for me, re the really exciting thing there is, turns out that my toolbox of techniques for working with scientists doesn't work so well on humanity scholars. Um, so just from a collaboration perspective, there's a lot of really interesting things going on. Um, I did, um, I have had some initial conversations with a financial advisor up in Park City named Carl Richards. I don't know if any of you guys have heard of him. He writes a blog for the New York Times about personal finance. Anyway, he's really interested in the idea of using visualization to help people make better, less emotional decisions in their personal finance. Again, early stage project, mostly just talking and looking at some data, but um, that's, pretty, that's pretty exciting. Um, which sort of gets at why I think what I do for someone like me who has a low attention span is so great because I constantly get to go and work with all these people who are experts in these different fields and learn about them. Um, so that's, anyway, it's not really answering your question, but I use it as an opportunity to talk about some other stuff. Um, have you ever done any experiments with trying to uh, present data in more than two dimensions? Right, so right. So two dimensions is good, three dimensions must be better, right? Well, not necessarily, uh, but I mean, what have you found? I'm curious to know. Right, so, so there is a lot of common, um, I'd, say, I'd say just uh, common uh, knowledge and wisdom in the community that for data that is not inherently spatial, so what I mean by that is in, spatial data would be things like you get an MRI, MRI scan and I want to look at you know, the shape of your brain or I have a fluid simulation and I want to look at vortices or something like that. That's data that has an inherent spatial physical component that makes sense to us. Abstract data, which is like everything that I showed you today, I'm sure it's the kind of data you guys are dealing with. Um, for people who work in that space, um, we by and large try to stay away from 3D for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, uh, uh, some of the problems are if you have like a 3D kind of display, you have to deal with obscured data, right? So if I have a three-dimensional scatter plot as opposed to a two-dimensional one, I have to move it. Who knows what I'm missing because I can't see? Uh, the way, when we actually look at things, you know, your screen is two dimensions. So we have to add all these visual cues to trick our brain into thinking it's three dimensions. We have to add things like shading, which can interfere with color channels. Um, or we have perspective correction, so where things in the background get smaller. That interferes with things like size channels. So, so there's, from a practical perspective, there, there's reasons why people try to stay away from it. Um, you do see it every now and again, but in general, um, I personally haven't found a good reason for to use it yet. I'd say yes and no. So certainly I think um, biology, again, just because I've learned a lot about that, um, is sort of the poster child, I think, for, for big data. Because advances in technology basically um, led them pretty close to the 24-hour, $1,000 genome sequencer, right? It took the Human Genome Project that was finished about 11, 11 years ago, it took them over a decade and $3 billion to sequence a human genome. Now you can do it for about $1,000 in less than a day. That is all based upon technology, and that's technology that was very much driven by these grand challenges. Um, but what we're seeing now, I think, that's really interesting, um, and this, I think, doesn't just apply to science. I think it applies to everything, um, which is just because we can measure it, is it worth it, right? You know, We're creating these huge, huge data sets, and clearly, we cannot analyze them. There's no way. And so, in some ways, different domains are waiting for technology and advances in you know, statistics and things like that in order to make sense of data, but I think there's this really important question of like, do we even need to measure everything that we're measuring? 
it's not clear. Biology has certainly seen some really big, there's some, there were some really big, well-funded projects um, that was data-driven science. So if we create the data, then magically we're gonna find all these new things we had never seen, and it didn't always happen. And so I think people are starting to question these things more and more. At that point, how do you choose what you work on, what project you did? I mean, why would you go to the poetry, poetry route? What value does that add to you? Honestly, I largely pick projects based upon people that I think are interesting and I wanna work with. So I, I'm pretty lucky in that there's very few, there's way less people in my position than there are people who have big data challenges. So I can be pretty, pretty picky. So I find people that I want to spend months on end talking to. That's that's a really important thing. I think that's sort of an important thing about collaboration. But it's also making sure that it's people who are on the cutting edge of their field. Um, and so that if you can make an impact on their work, you're likely to have a bigger impact of, um, among many people. And then not everyone is open to the idea that, um, that A, visualization can help them, or B, that as a computer scientist, I bring any value other than just writing a program for them. So finding people who that are also open to the and, and respectful of the fact that we have a research process, we have research goals, and trying to meld that with the things they want to do sort of makes for the, 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 the kinds of things I look for in collaborators. Otherwise, you know, for me, data is data is data, and if someone's excited about their project, I'm likely to be excited about the topic too. Uh, that's been my impression. So. Pretty nice to be able to pick and choose your projects and uh, the people you work with. It reminds me of a leadership principle, never work with jerks. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope you can appreciate the translation of what we've heard today into the business world. As I was listening to Mariah talk, I thought about a friend of mine who's a geologist. He's been hired by an oil company in the shale uh, area, and they're studying rock patterns, looking for probabilities of, uh, or richness, of oil deposits embedded in those uh, rock patterns. And so you can see right away the financial implication of picking high probability versus low probability patterns. But then think of the number of rock patterns in whatever shale belt you want to explore, whether it's Ohio or Pennsylvania or just out uh, in Summit County or east in Summit County up in uh, Uintas. So that is, hits me immediately as big data that's available now, wasn't available 10 years ago, a, a scientific production technique that didn't exist 15 years ago. And fortunes have been made and lost in this area. To say nothing of the international implications of the US becoming oil independent as opposed to oil dependent. So. Um, big complex system. Big complex <laughs> system. But what else resides with it, right? You can change the world. Okay. You absolutely can change the world. And along the way, you don't have to worry about do you make more money as a faculty member in computing or in business? <laughs> <laughs> so thank Mariah for joining us.